But I read out of my German hymn book that my grandma gave me. I read out of that every morning. It's, it helps me to keep associated with the language, the words, and everything. It's, it's just special to me. I lived on a farm. We didn't have electricity. And when I started school, I had four miles to walk one way. And my mother thought six, I was too young, so I didn't start first grade till I was seven. And I didn't understand or could speak any uh, English because uh, my parents always talked German at home. Our, we had also had German in school. Our catechism was German on one side and English on the other. It was Swan's little red uh, catechism. And uh, I guess I had German till about third grade. You know, electricity was a big thing when that came about. Oh, my mother uh, and iron. Because before that, you had to heat up that wood stove in the kitchen and uh, to heat those irons. So uh, the iron, in fact, she bought it before we even got the electricity. Indoor or outdoor toilet? Oh, definitely outdoor. And I'm afraid to ask, uh, Sears and Roebuck catalog or corn cobs? <laughs> uh, uh, I remember the Sears Roebuck catalog. <laughs> But I heard about the corn cobs. <laughs> Edgar Eugene Dreyer. They call it Edgar Eugene Dreyer. That's German. But I have an older brother. We still speak German. That's all we talk. He's 80, 86. And uh, when we're by ourselves, we just talk German. And. Uh, my mom and dad, we, uh, we talk, that's all we ever talk. We, we, I didn't know any English when I started school mm -hmm. in 1941. And how old are you? 78. I have two sisters and one brother. I had an older sister. She died when she was 13 years old on my fourth birthday, uh, April 29, 1939, she died. And the one thing I do remember about her was the coffin. In those days, they brought the coffin into the house, in the Gute Stube, the living room. You know, it was, that's the room that was closed off all the time. And I do remember that. So uh, she never got, did not get to be confirmed. Because she was, was sick, I guess, from December on until uh, she died in April, you know. Winter fever, they call it in that day, those days. It's pneumonia nowadays, so just couldn't get over it. My mom said it was the hardest thing she ever went through. I, I think it made a little problem with, you know, man and wife too, you know. Because they say, well, you could have done something different, or, you know. Now you walked four miles to school every day. Yeah. Okay. Everybody said uphill both ways. <laughs> In the snow. <laughs> In the snow. And we walked the snow. Now our parents did not take us. It had to be bad weather. Did you know there was uh, daylight saving time in the Second World War? Well, that's, yeah, that's when they started it. And when we started in the winter time, from back there, we started with a coal oil lantern walking, and walked about halfway and left it either along the road somewhere or else at, at like uh, where Brent Roth lives now. And then you know, by the time we got there, it was light enough to see. And then walking home, you didn't need it. You know, you'd get yeah. home in time for dark. But there was daylight saving time in the Second World War. So, well, uh, we even as as kids when we were walking to school. Uh, we always talk German. Now we did argue over tractors. I know that's not German cultures, but we had international tractors. The neighbor had Alice John, and the other one had John Deere. And mine was always better than yours, and yours was better than mine. I know one night going home down our farm lane, there was we were really arguing bad about tractors, and I was the only one for international. And here they got mad at me. And they pushed me down in a gully. There was one gully next to the road, and there was one tin can. It cut a cut me here in the back. So uh, we went, got me home, and Doc, they took me into Doc Fisher, and he put hog rings. Oh. <laughs> That's how I clamped, little, little tiny little hog rings, clamped them together. Then he wrapped my whole face, my mouth, my nose, my ears and eyes were looking out. That's the way I went to school next day. I went to the eighth grade here, then I went to Aldenburg, had public school, to the 10th grade. Then my dad said, Junge, jetzt musst du arbeiten. Son, now you have to go to work. So I went to work. 
I never went any further. And I really don't, don't regret not having any more education because the good Lord blessed me with what I did. Myrtle Keenard, Myrtle Schilling Keenard. Dad never went to public school. They learned it as they were living among the people that spoke English. As we then, in school, we had the German, the Aufgabebuch, <laughs> German uh, uh, grammar, and English. So we had two days a week, we had German and English, because we had an English book and a German book. And I helped in the kitchen. Lillian did the same thing. In fact, she and I were not, uh, we only were allowed to go as far as ninth grade. And then when I was married and uh, I always wanted to go to school, I wanted to be a stenographer. And uh, my husband said one time, he said, if you would have been a stenographer, you would have never looked at me because <laughs> he was interested in farming. Mm. So anyhow, um, well, didn't get, so I cried for a couple of weeks. I wanted to go to school. I was baptized here in front of this altar and confirmed here and married here. He was three years older than me. Oh yeah, I remember him going to school and I was in fourth grade and he was in seventh. I know he said he sat up here, the young boys always would sit up here. And he said, uh, and the younger girls were always supposed to walk in here and sit up front here with their grandparents or some family member. And he told me once that he said to one of those boys as I walked in, he said, I'm going to ask her out one day. He asked me once after a church service in the evening whether I would go out with him. See, I was a little nervous and he was, <laughs> whether I would go, I said to him, well, we're going to have to talk to my dad. He said, well, I'll go with you. So he was talking over here with uh, his, some of his neighbors, and I approached him from the back side. I said, Dad, um, Ernie had asked me whether I would go with him. And he said to him, you have her home, though, by 12 o'clock. <laughs> so he said, you have her home by 12 o'clock because I call her at 4.30 to help me milk. I always had to help Dad Mill. Now, how old were you when you when uh, when you got asked out that time? Thirteen. Thirteen. Mm -hmm. He was my first date. Yeah. Oh man. And all we we just went up to town and uh, at uh, Johnny's Fables place he had a little tavern and um, we played the jukebox and uh, we each drank a beer and then we went. At thirteen. Mm -hmm. Well, there was no restrictions at that time. Mm -mm. We dated um, when I was 14 and 15 years old, and he was called into the service uh, in 1940 when the Second World War started, and he went to um, Great Lakes to get his training. Eight weeks he was there. We promised each other that if he would come back, we would get married. So I was promised to him. But he said, I don't want to get married because he said, if I won't come back, then I don't want you to be a young widow. But we rode each other all the time, no matter where he was. Sometimes I had to wait three weeks, sometimes a month before, it depended on where he was. He was aboard ship most of the time. We always kept count. Every time I wrote him a letter, I put a number on it. And he said, well, that was number 500 and something. I guess I wrote him close to a thousand letters, and he wrote me about 700 because he didn't always have a chance. Yeah, I wrote to him every day. I saved all the ones that he sent me, but he said, I'm sorry I could not save the ones for, from you because he said we were out at sea and it was so rough, and they said, get rid of everything that uh, is not that important. He said, I hated to do that, but he said, I had them saved. And then one guy came around and he said, what's that? He said, those are my letters. Oh, he said, you don't have to have them. So he said it was with a heavy heart that he put them overboard. He, uh, he said they always called him Kraut because he knew German. Mm -hmm. 
with all the other Navy men on board ship. And they were fighting the uh, Japanese, and he was a turret gunner aboard his ship. Mm -hmm. They were in a convoy, and he said the uh, the Japanese pilots, their, their mission was to commit Harry Carey and put that plane down the smokestack of one of those carriers. And so he said, I, one guy always said, Kraut, get him or I'm going to leave. He said, where in the heck are you going to go? He said, you have to go in the drink. Anyhow, so he said, and when he was home, then he sometimes sat there and contemplated. He said, yeah, I, I shot husbands, brothers, and, and um, sons, and that bothered him. I said, honey, it was war. You, you were committed. You had uh, said that you would defend our country, and they were threatening us, so. Yeah. <laughs> Uncle Adi's wife, she said once at the dining room table, she said that only German people, German-speaking people would get to heaven. And my husband had an answer for her. He said, well, she, he said, the Lord Jesus um, didn't speak German, 